Hi friends, today we're doing Unit 7, Lesson 9, Space Exploration. We're going to start by going over the key vocabulary words that you'll be hearing in today's reading. Our first word is module, a segment or section of a spacecraft designed to do a specific job. Our next word is probes, unmanned spacecraft sent to explore space and gather information. Our next word is reusable, able to be used again. Our next word is spacecraft a manned or unmanned vehicle designed to travel into space for research and exploration. And our last word is triumph, a special achievement, success, accomplishment, or victory. We are now going to move into today's reading. Nicholas Copernicus was a Polish astronomer, mathematician, and clergyman who was studying the night sky around the same time that Columbus arrived in America. Copernicus, with the help of other scientists before and after him, changed our understandings of astronomy when he discovered that the universe was not geocentric. How were just a handful of people able to come up with an idea that, the, that changed the whole world? It's quite simple, really. Copernicus began by studying something he was really interested in, the night sky. His interest led him to make careful observations, to ask questions, to work hard, to study, to think logically, to come up with new answers, and to build upon the work of other scientists before him. His willingness to ask questions, even when he had to stand alone with his ideas, led Copernicus to make an important scientific discovery, that our solar system is heliocentric, or sun-centered. All of science is based upon careful observations of the world and a willingness to ask questions about it. Asking questions allows us to come up with new ideas, and new ideas lead to a better understanding about how the world works. That's what the process of science is all about. So whenever you observe the world around you and you ask questions about what you see, you should be proud of yourself because you are thinking like a scientist. Not too many years after Copernicus died, the telescope was invented. Galileo was one of the first astronomers to build and use a telescope. Very soon, many astronomers began using telescopes to take a closer look at the stars. This gave them new information, and so astronomers were able to learn even more about the universe and gather more evidence that supported Copernicus's helio heliocentric theory. As you heard earlier, astronomers discovered the planet Neptune fewer than 200 years ago in 1846, when they were finally able to see it with a more powerful telescope. Astronomers continued building different types of and more powerful telescopes, which led to an even better understanding of space and more questions about it, too. Discovering more objects similar in size to Pluto led scientists to ask again, how should Pluto be classified? With more information available, astronomers came up with a brand new answer to that question. Today, telescopes that astronomers use are usually located in areas far away from cities. Where there are cities, there is also a lot of light, and where there is a lot of light on Earth, it is harder to see the light of the stars. Light made by humans that hinders or blocks our view of the stars is called light pollution. Besides building telescopes far away from light pollution, astronomers also like to build telescopes on high mountains. You might think it's so the astronomers can get closer to the stars, but it's not really that much closer. An observatory is a building designed especially for observing the stars, planets, and other space objects. Placing an observatory high on a mountain allows astronomers to get above as much of Earth's atmosphere as possible. And as the Earth's atmosphere thins out in higher places, astronomers can more clearly look at the light of the stars. A more powerful telescope was built for the Lowell Observatory, observatory in Arizona for the purpose of finding Pluto. Astronomers thought that Pluto existed before they ever saw it. There appeared to be something in space beyond Uranus and Neptune that was exerting a strong gravitational pull on these planets. Astronomers searched for 25 years before they finally discovered Pluto. But there's another way that scientists are now able to place telescopes even higher than the highest mountain. Telescopes are launched into space. That's right. Scientists now use rockets to escape Earth's surface gravity. The power of rockets enables spacecraft to launch telescopes into space. Once beyond Earth's atmosphere, the telescopes can study the universe more closely and cleverly than ever before. Some spacecraft are held in orbit around Earth, around Earth by its gravity. Other spacecraft have ventured beyond the Earth, the reach of Earth's gravity, to explore other parts of the solar system. Telescopes and cameras aboard the space probes, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, have spent the last 35 years gathering information about Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune and the outermost reaches of our solar system. Telescopes that are launched into space are literally out of this world. 
and they are able to take pictures of the universe that are also out of this world. The Hubble Space Telescope is the most famous telescope ever to be launched into space. It was carried into orbit by a space shuttle in 1990, and it now orbits about 350 miles above the surface of Earth. Because there is a very little light pollution in orbit, and because Earth's atmosphere does not get in the way and cause distortion, this powerful telescope helps scientists see deeper into the universe than ever before. The Hubble Space Telescope has provided scientists with new information and fantastic pictures about our own solar system, distant stars, faraway galaxies, and other celestial bodies and occurrences. New discoveries in science, such as the telescope, always lead to new questions. For most of human history, many of the questions and theories people had about space came from simply gazing up at the night sky. People could look up at the moon and the planets and the stars, but these celestial bodies were completely beyond reach. Once humans invented a way to fly in airplanes, which was only a little more than 100 years ago, the question soon became, can we fly beyond Earth's atmosphere all the way into space? The exciting answer to that question was a loud yes. In 1957, a group of countries, then called the Soviet Union, which included Russia, sent the first satellite made by humans into space. The satellite was called Sputnik 1, and it was, a, and it was an aluminum sphere that was only about the size of a beach ball. This small artificial satellite began a whole new revolution in space exploration. Can you guess what scientists' next question was? It was this. If we can send a satellite into space, can we also send a living being into space? A month later, Russia sent a dog named Likey into space. Likey was the first living being to ever go into space. After Likey's mission, several more dogs were successfully sent into space. Can you guess what the next question was? Right. If we can send a dog into space, can we send a human into space? In 1961, the Soviets again answered this question with a resounding, enthusiastic yes. The first human being to go into space was Soviet cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin, aboard the spacecraft Vostok 1. Cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin orbited the globe in Vostok 1 for 108 minutes before returning to Earth. With the new triumph or accomplishment, scientists asked a new question. If we can send a human being into space, can we also send one to land on the moon? What do you think the answer was? A triumphant yes. In 1969, United States sent three astronauts into space, Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, and Buzz Aldrin. These astronauts traveled to the moon in a, sp in a spacecraft called Apollo 11, which had three sections, the lunar module, or section of the Apollo 11 was named the Eagle, and it landed on the moon with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin aboard. Meanwhile, astronaut Michael Collins orbited the moon in Apollo 11 command module, which was called the Columbia. A third service module provided power, oxygen, and water. On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong became the first human being to ever walk on the moon. Soon after his feet, which were inside a spacesuit, touched the surface, Neil Armstrong spoke these famous words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Soon after Armstrong said these famous words, Buzz Aldrin joined him to walk on the surface, where they bounced and hopped to get around because of the moon's low gravity. The astronauts had to plan their movements six or seven steps ahead because movement on the moon is different from movement on Earth. They also discovered that the fine moon soil was quite slippery. Together, Armstrong and Aldrin collected four, about 48 pounds of moon rocks and brought them back to Earth to be studied. They took many photographs and performed experiments to learn about the moon. Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin rejoined pilot Michael Collins aboard Apollo 11's Columbia, where they lived while in space, and they all returned safely to Earth. Thanks to Earth's gravity, the Columbia came back through Earth's atmosphere and splashed down in the Pacific Ocean. There are lots of pictures of the Columbia in magazines and on the internet. And someday, if you ever visit Washington, D.C., you can see the Columbia at the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. In the past, spacecraft like the Apollo 11 were only able to fly into space and back one time. They were not reusable. But with advances in technology, reusable spacecraft have been developed. Reusing the space shuttles has saved time, money, and valuable resources. As scientists continue to explore space in the future, we will continue to better understand both space and the universe. And as we continue to learn more, you can be sure that there will be many new questions that will be asked. 
Maybe you will be asking and even answering some of them. You may now move on to Unit 7, Lesson 9, Google Form.